Right, hello everyone, today we are going to be reviewing the book The Complete Manual of Positional Chess. And this is a book that I personally heard some good things about, but I never quite got around to reading it. So today I want to give you guys a kind of review on what I've found from going over it in the last few weeks or so. So essentially, for those of you who don't know, this book was written by two Russian grandmasters and trainers who were basically seeking to create a sort of structured chess curriculum for the young, talented juniors in Russia. And they describe this book as being for players rated at the Kwarsk level, which in Russia is like 2000 to 2200 ELO, but I still believe even if you're not at that level, even if you're like 1600, I could still imagine you would get a lot out of this book. But if you were like lower than 1600, let's say, I think there are probably some better books out there, which you could probably find. So basically, by the way, this book was split into two major sections, one being on the opening and another on the middle game. And there was also a second volume, which I'm not reviewing this time, but maybe another time, in the middle game structures and dynamics. And personally, I find, especially the section openings, I think for especially people around that 1600 level I described earlier, who aren't like, say, maybe 2000 or so, this section is particularly going to be useful, I believe. Because at this level, you probably understand, like, general opening principles and whatnot, but you still probably have games where, like, your opponent breaks them, and you can't quite punish them, and I think this book does a really good job at kind of gathering lots of different examples, showing how you can punish your opponents for making these typical mistakes, and there was one really good game here that I want to show you guys, which really illustrates that. And so this game here, the author was playing against another very strong grandmaster, right around 2500, and essentially this example was aiming at showing how do you punish early queen moves, and okay, the author was playing white, he's not talking about his queen moves, rather black's early queen move of queen b6 here, where you target the b2 pawn, which is somewhat logical, right? We see this in a bunch of openings like the French defense, but here the author insists that this is not such a good move. But the way to punish black here is definitely not to play a move like queen c2, when the author points out c5, knight c6, black's attacking d4 pawn, and black has a pretty good initiative here. Rather, what white should do is just simply give up the pawn for move like knight bd2. And a lot of people might pick this up and be like, okay, that's normal, yeah, you go queen takes b2, and e4, you have big center, you have initiative. But the problem is a lot of people would sort of get stuck around these positions, where it's like an opening book would typically tell them, okay, you're down a pawn, but you have initiative, good job, uh, now go ahead and win the game. But the problem is in practice, it is really that simple. And so I thought it was really great that you all collected a bunch of games like these, not just one or two, I think they're like, at least four or five in this chapter on early queen moves, which help you really kind of get used to how to exploit this sort of advantage if you, of course, you like go through the games and really try to understand what's going on here. And so just to put some further moves on the board here to really show what happened here, uh, one really good point was that why didn't play bishop takes a6 and after queen takes a6 it'd be difficult to castle and whatnot, so white played the very strong bishop c4 now, and of course if black wants to make the exchange, knight takes c4, the queen's getting kicked around more, this isn't so good. And this was illustrated further in the game by black playing queen a6 castles, and here black thought they could take on e4, the point being that after queen takes e4, the queen is deflected away from the knight here. The author continues to show that in this position, even though black is two pawns up, this is really just too difficult to defend here, and although they did end up playing inaccurately, they did end up winning the game. And again, as I just said, you know, like the authors, they don't just show like one example, like oh, this is early queen moves are bad, here's just one example, go ahead now. They really attack it from many different angles so you can really see in different sorts of positions how in one position a certain plan might work well, where in another maybe you have to approach this position in a slightly different way, and I think that's really good. And all in all in the book, there are like 250 examples covering a wide range of different topics, which is really going to give you the sort of comprehension to tackle uh, a lot of different scenarios in chess which you may have come across but you never quite really understood quite how to handle. And so I've talked about how the opening section of this book is quite instructive, even for plays all the way down to like, I don't know, 1600, 1500, I still believe you can get a lot out of this, but what about the middle game section of the book? And I believe this section gets a bit more advanced, and I think that this is definitely where the 2200 ELO thing makes sense, but that being said, even if I was 1600 reading this, I still believe that there's a lot I could get out of it, even if I wasn't able to completely grasp everything. And here is actually one of my favourite examples from this book, and this one for me, like, this was a definitely a bit more of an advanced one, but just goes to show it's not even just, like, very fundamental, like, strategy stuff, even if you've read a bunch of these kind of strategy books before, I think there's going to be something that you can get out of this book, and that's what, at least what I found here. I had never seen this game before, 
and I was very kind of just mind boggled by this whole move that Karpov played here. This was a game between Anatoly Karpov, by the way, and Alexei Shirov, where I was kind of thinking White would play a move like Knight of 5 and try to go F4, kicking this Knight away, and sort of gain some initiative in the center. But what Karpov instead did was he played a very different move. Bishop takes e5, and I was like, whoa. The basic idea is this after queen takes e5, bishop d3. And the idea is very simple. In essence, we're just simply lining the, this queen and bishop up, this battery on the long diagonal, and taking aim at black's king here. And like, the reason I found this so mind boggling is just the fact that it's like, if you just look at this position normally, it's like most people, the at least once you reach a certain level, right? Like, when you kind of start out playing chess, right? Like, to you, like, any exchange is just like, okay, let's let's do this, chop, and you sort of do that, right? But once you get a little bit stronger, you start to be like, okay, generally I probably shouldn't trade a bishop for a knight like this. That probably isn't such a good idea. And so this, the whole idea of playing that move just won't even go on your radar. But then to see a very strong player like Anatoly Karpov play such a move, it's like, oh, maybe I should be sort of looking out for these ideas and shouldn't be so open-minded when it comes to exchanging pieces like this. By the way, this game was from the chapter on kind of good and bad exchanges which is once again like a very important fundamental topic in chess so it was really cool to see this example here showing an exchange which would otherwise very often be kind of criticized uh actually work out very well and this is what happens here bishop d3 taking aim this h7 pawn if uh, black plays g6, white can like take on g6 and get some decisive attack. And if black doesn't do this and they instead play a move like h6 here, white can still get a very uh, nice initiative on the light squares here. As happened in the game here, white starts infiltrating with moves like rook a7. And uh, yeah, things ended up closing very quickly for black and white won the game in very nice fashion. And so this is the last example I want to show in this video. And the reason I really liked it is that it's not just purely like... Here's some strategic idea. It also shows how concretely, like, sort of calculation, that side of the game blends in with strategy and that you can't really just isolate one another. They sort of intertwine. And so in this position, what Black did essentially was they played this move G4. And the basic idea is, that, by the way, if White ever takes this, what we will do is simply play Bishop A6. And now if the Bishop takes F1, we will be up in exchange. If White takes this back, we can simply win this. Rook C2 is coming. This is completely winning. And if white in this position plays a very natural looking knight d4, a forward knight move, after simply knight takes d4, rook c2 here, uh, even though there's opposite colored bishops, here black is simply winning just due to our active rook here. And this is the whole point of the awful one to get across actually, is that in this whole position, even though there's opposite colored bishops, with rooks on the board and black being the attacking side, very much in like the middle game in general principle is that the attacking side, uh, if there's opposite colored bishops, will have a huge advantage, even though we're sort of in the end game, the same principle holds true. Which is why in this position, the very strong move was knight g1 here. The basic idea being that now, if black takes this knight on g1, black isn't simply going to take this rook Sorry, this knight here on g1, like if king takes or rook takes, but then just rook c2, right? And we have a very similar situation to what we just saw. But the whole point is that now white can play rook c1 here. And essentially, it's very difficult for black to avoid this sort of rook trade now. So after takes, takes, this knight is trapped here on g1. And what we are going to get, essentially, is an opposite colored bishop endgame, no rooks on the board, which makes this a uh, very horrible position for white, and that is indeed what happened in the game here. So as you can tell, there were a lot of things about the book I liked. I should also mention that in general, the annotations I felt were very good. It wasn't like the authors were just dumping a bunch of stuff on you and being like, okay, kid, go ahead, read the book now. They were sort of being like, okay, like... Here's some examples, but we're also going to give you the very important variations. We're going to explain why this is important. And I found that to be very instructive. And I think a lot of people get a lot out of that. But what you might not necessarily get out of this book is sort of a blueprint for in general making better decisions in sort of positional or strategic situations. This book is going to give you a good foundation for the plans that you might approach with many sorts of different scenarios and chess with, but it's not going to give you that sort of general blueprint which a book like, for example, GM Preparation, Positional Play will. Uh, I found that book, for me, was very transformational. The reason being that it didn't necessarily try to focus on any sort of like specific areas of chess, it gave a very sort of general approach which can apply to basically any sort of position, where of course there's not like crazy tactical stuff going on, and I found that to be very useful with this book. Uh, I mean, the, the whole thing is it's not necessarily a criticism per se, because the book was never intended to do that. To begin with, it's just sort of worth pointing out that you shouldn't really treat the book as such. Alright, so that's just about wraps things up for this video. Thank you for sticking around till the end. 
If you liked it, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and also check out the link below to this book. I'll leave that in the description, so check that out, since you're probably interested at this point if you stuck around until the end. But with that being said, I hope you guys have a good day, and I'll see you until next time.